We are in business. All right, now we have We have another exam that's due today, right? Please take one of these and pass them around. And then after you do that, take one of these and pass it around. Ooh, this one didn't get stapled. Uh-oh. I think you'll have one more opportunity after this one. So here's the next mini exam. Make sure that when you get it, it does have three problems on it. Pardon? Yes, that's not the mini exam though. That's a handout that we're gonna go over today. And then anybody turning in today? Wasn't there one due today? If you were gonna do it? Thank you. Thank you. And then I think I did adjust that grade. I'm pretty sure I did. Did you look on Canvas? Okay, it should have. When I went and looked at it, it looked like I had already made the adjustment. So if you. Is it, that's what it was originally? Originally? Before? Okay, so then I'll have to go back in and, and do that. Let me keep that. Okay, and then as far as the other exams, uh, the mini exam five, I've posted grades for those. I'm gonna just hand them out, take yours out of here, pass that around. And I think that, that covers, pardon? There's an extra, extra of these. So everyone has the handout, parametric surfaces, and then mini exam seven. Did you do one Everyone has a copy of that? You don't? Know, are they still going around? Mini exam seven? No? Oh, they're going. Oh, where are they? Oh, right there. Grab, grab one. Yeah, they're coming. Oh, you know what? Did I put the due date? The, the first? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so last class we were talking about Green's theorem, right? And we are going to move now into the next section called Curl and Divergence. I think I will shut just this one so we don't get too bad of a glare. A little bit better. All right, so we're gonna talk about Curl and Divergence. And as it states here, Curl and divergence are two what we call vector field operations. So the idea is that you're going to, you know how we started this chapter talking about vector fields? And like you could have vector field defined in two or three dimensional space. Now what we have are some operations that we can do on those vector fields. They are called curl and divergence. And they're gonna have some pretty um, impactful results, or we're gonna get some impactful results from this. So let's first define them, all right? So given a vector field F, we're gonna define the curl and divergence. The, the first thing to note is that when you, when you look at what's called the curl of the vector field F, it's a computation that we're gonna do, and the answer is going to be a vector. So you start with the vector field, and then you do the curl of it and you get a vector. And we'll talk about what it means and all that, but the important thing is that you get a vector out. Now, when you take a vector field and find the divergence of the vector field, this is gonna result in a scalar, in, in, in a, basically a number, okay? And we'll, we'll put some meaning to it. So first we start with curl. So if we have a vector field in three-dimensional space where it has three component functions, P, Q, and R, and the partial derivatives of those um, component functions exist, then the curl of F is defined to be, and this is the way 
we write it, curl F, is defined to be this new vector. So remember, the answer is a vector. So if you're not big on memorizing formulas, which I don't think people like to have to memorize things, there's another way to write this so that you can just calculate it without having to have that memorized. And here's what it is. <clears throat> what we're going to do, remember how we do cross products? Remember how we do a cross product? We get two vectors and then we like cover up one thing and do the little, right, that little thing. Basically, the curl of a, of a vector field is the cross product of this and F. But the question is, what is this? And this is, a, this is a notation we are going to use, which stands for the, what's called the uh, differential operator. So what it is, is, well, let me, give you, let me give you an example. If we had two vectors, two, three, four, let's say negative one, zero, and seven. If I asked you to find the cross product, you would do this and then multiply, right? But when you're doing this and this, you would do three times seven, wouldn't you? And then you go minus this times this, right? Well, what's happening here is that one of the vectors we're using, right? One of the vectors that we're using, let's say this top one, is no longer like numbers. What it is is an operator. So it's telling you what you need to do. So watch. If I, if I take this thing, which we'll call del, okay? Del, D-E-L. Then del is the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z respectively here. We're going to put that in here just like we did this vector. And then our bottom vector is f, that's our field. And then what we do is the first computations, we cover this up and it's not multiplication here anymore. This means take the partial with respect to y of r. And then subtract from that the partial with respect to z of q. Does that make sense? So it's an operation you're doing as opposed to a multiplication. Does that notation make sense? And then to do the middle one, cover that up, take the partial with respect to x of r, and then subtract from it the partial with respect to um, z of p. But then remember, you change the signs because it's the middle one. So that's why these are like ordered backwards. And then the last one, you know, you cover this up and go here, here. And that gives you the last component. And that is the curl, all right? So let's, let's tr try and just remember it as curl of f is del cross f. But you have to remember that the del is just the partials, the, the differential operator. OK, let's do an example. And then we'll, we'll see what, uh, what the curl actually is. So I'd like for us to find the curl of f. <coughs> and f is defined to be this vector field right here. So the curl of f, by definition, is del cross f, right? Which we will do this, um, the, let's see, the del first. So let me write del first. Partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z. And then below it, I'm going to put pqr. So p is x squared y z and then q is x y squared z and then um, p q and then r so r is x y z squared so now we want to do our <coughs> cross product right so i believe we've been using that notation did we use that notation yeah that's the notation that we're using with the bars on it. Now, I'm not putting i, j, k, all right? I'm not putting i, j, k. I'm just going to leave it just like we did when we did a cross product of two vectors. Here they are. So you ready for the first part? And remember, our answer is a vector. So we're going to cover this one up. And then we do the partial with respect to y of this, which is? We're doing derivative, not anti-derivative. So the partial derivative with respect to y of this. xz squared. XZ squared right? So xz squared minus, and now we do this one, right? 
So partial with respect to z of this, xy squared. XY squared. Okay, and that's the first component. Questions on that? Now we do the middle component, so we cover this one up. We do the partial with respect to x of this. What's partial of x with respect to this? yz squared, and then I'm gonna have to change the sign of that, right? Because it's the middle one. So I'm gonna do minus yz squared. And then I'm supposed to do subtract this one, right? Partial of z, uh, partial with respect to z of this. I'm supposed to subtract that. But then I'm supposed to subtract it again. So it's gonna be a plus here, isn't it? Right? Okay, so what is the partial of that with respect to z? x squared y, so plus x squared y. And then our last component, we cover up the k component and then do this. So partial with respect to x of this is y squared z, and then minus, and then here. So x squared z, there we go. So that is the mechanical process of taking the, finding the curl of a vector field, all right? Now, it says to find the curl and the magnitude of the curl at the point two, one, zero. So remember, we have a vector field, right? Given to us in the beginning, that means in three-dimensional space, if I move to some point, there is a vector, right? Pointing in some direction. And that happens at every single point in this space. What we have calculated is this new vector. And so what we want to know is, you know, what is this new vector at a specific point? Just, I could have picked any point, but we're picking two, one, zero. So let's find the curl of F. at the point two, one, zero. And that would be equal to, so we plug in two for x, one for y, and zero for z into this. And what do we get here? Zero there, right? Yeah. Minus uh, two times one squared, so negative two. And then zero again, and then two squared, right? Times one. So four, and then here that's going to be zero, and that's going to be zero. There we go. So that is the curl vector at that point. I still haven't explained what it is, right? Right, now I want the magnitude of the curl. So the magnitude of the curl is the magnitude of the curl of F. With, at the point two one zero, which is the square root of what negative two squared plus four squared plus sixteen. I mean, sorry, yeah, plus zero squared. So root twenty. Yes. So that's all the mechanics behind how you do how you compute the curl, how you compute the curl at a single point, how you find the magnitude of the curl. So. That's it. Now, what is it, right? So what is this vector? What is this vector and what is this magnitude? Um, oh, I guess we'll do this one first before we get to it. How about this? Give you a vector field, okay? And ask you for the, um, to find the magnitude of the curl. So what do you see as an issue here, as a problem? Do you see an, an issue we might run into? Okay. So our, our vector field is two-dimensional, yeah. not three-dimensional. And to do a cross product, you, ha you have to be in three-dimensional space, right? Cross products don't exist in two-dimensional space. So what we do is we extend this out to three-dimensional space. What we do is we say, okay, this vector field may as well be a three-dimensional vector field where we have the vector zero, negative x squared, and zero. So what we're doing is we're just gonna use zero for our z component of our vector field. Does that make sense? 
So the, the way you can visualize this is, this is a two-dimensional vector field, right? Like on a flat sheet of paper. What we're saying is let's make that be like on the ground in three-dimensional space. And we're only looking on the ground. We're not looking anywhere above or below it. So the vector field is only really defined down on the surface, X, like in the XY plane. But now the, the, the cross product is defined. So this is a pretty standard practice on how we get around the two-dimensional uh, limitations. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do curl F. Curl of F is going to be equal to del crossed with F, which will be partial with respect to X, partial with respect to Y, partial with respect to Z, and then we have zero, uh, negative X squared, and zero. This should be a pretty easy cross product where you get lots of zeros in here. This answer should be a vector. And so we cover this up and do the partial with respect to y of zero, which is zero, and then the partial with respect to z of this, which is also zero. So we get zero for our first component. And then for our second component, zero. we get zero again. All right. And then for the third component, we don't get zero. We get partial with respect to x of this, which is negative 2x, and then minus zero. So negative 2x. I have a question for you. If we have a two-dimensional vector field, no matter what it is, okay, so in this case it's this and this, but what if I made that like y squared, whatever, x, or this one, change it? Is there anything special about what comes out when you do the curl if you start with a two-dimensional vector field? Like what will always be, if we go from two-dimensional to this three-dimensional, what will always be here? This zero right there. That zero will always be there, right? This zero will always be there. So let's just think about what would happen. When I do this, when I do this, this right here will be zero. And what can you tell me about this? There won't be any z's, right? This won't have any z's. Because remember, we're starting with two-dimensional vector fields, so it's only x's and y's. So when you take the partial with respect to z of this, it will always be zero, zero right? So when you have a two-dimensional vector field and you compute the curl, your first component's always zero. What about your second component? Okay, so you're going to do this, right, which will be zero, because that's always zero. And then the partial with respect to z of this piece, which is that one, right? But again, that piece won't have any z's in it. So that will also be zero. But when you get to the last part, this part could, it could be zero, but it could also not be zero, right? So in other words, if you, if you think about that vector field lives, that vector field lives in the xy plane, right? So imagine like at every point on the ground, we have little, little vectors all over the place. Okay, those are all on the ground, okay? The curl vector is this, and we'll always have zero, zero here, which means the curl vector points which way? Vertical. Either vertical or, or like up or down, but it's orthogonal to the xy plane. Won't it always be? It'll always be orthogonal to the xy plane. That's only when you're going and finding the curl of a two-dimensional vector space the curl vector is sticking straight up or straight down out of, the, out of the ground. Make sense? Okay. All right, so that, uh, we, found the, the, we found the curl, we never found the magnitude. What would the magnitude of this be? Just the square root of this square plus this square plus this squared, so should it just be two x? Yeah. Okay. Or actually the absolute value, because when you do the magnitude of this, okay, let's say we were doing the magnitude of this, then this would be the square root of uh, zero squared plus zero squared plus negative two squared, which is four x squared, right? And when you take, um, when you take the square root of something squared, it's, technically it is the absolute value. 
So like the square root of x squared is actually not x, it's the absolute value of x. It's only x if, if x started out positive. If you knew that x was positive, then this would be true. I mean, sorry, then it would just be x. That's a side note. I mean, that's something from, from way back when. But all right. Now, are we going to talk about what it is? Are, are you all at all curious to, to know what it is? Like, what is this vector? Why is it important? What does it tell us? Nah. So here's the geometric interpretation of the curl vector. This, this little animation that I have here was one of the hardest things I've ever tried to code up um, for this class. So let me try and explain what's going on here. And I think I'm going to zoom in. All right. So what I want you to see here, we're in three-dimensional space, right? If I were to pick a particular point in that space, that's x, y, z, okay? So I've got some point sitting in space. There it is, the black point. Now, the red vector, okay, the red vector is the vector field. So let's say that that's like um, gravitational force or something like that, some force. I think what would be better is if we looked at this as almost like a, let's, look, let's imagine that our vector field represents like a, a flowing fluid, like water or something. So this is some molecule of water, and the red vector is telling you the direction at which your, your flow is. So at that particular point, that little molecule wants to move in that direction. And then the length of that vector is how fast it wants to move in that direction. With me? The curl vector is this vector, all right? The curl vector is this vector, and it might be kind of hard for me to show you this. Let me see if I, it looks orthogonal, doesn't it? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, okay? The curl vector does not have to be orthogonal. Let me move it around. Ah, now I won't move it. Okay, there it is. Now, I have to animate this for, for you to appreciate it. I'm going to press play here, and I want you to watch something. Okay, you see that? So imagine you're that little molecule, right? And you're trying to, your, your direction that you want to move in is in the direction of the red vector. So you want to go that way, right? But there's these other molecules around you that are having an impact on you too. It's like almost, you can look at almost like friction between the molecules. They're rubbing one another and the ones around you are kind of bumping you and they're making you want to turn curl, right? So what's happening is even though I'm moving in the direction of the red vector, I have this like rotation happening also. And so the curl vector gives you the axis of rotation. So maybe I'm headed in that direction. Let me do it with a, uh, I'll do it with this. I don't have anything that's around. Let's say this is our molecule. Let's say we're headed in that direction. I could have a curl vector that is like this. And then what's happening is that as I'm moving in that direction, I'm wanting to like spin as I move in that direction. But that curl vector is my axis of rotation. So it's like trying to, trying to spin and move like that. Make sense? But that does not have to be, the curl vector doesn't have to be like orthogonal. It could have been like this. In which case, I'm trying to move in that direction, but I'm, I'm spinning more like this now. Does that make sense? Imagine this is a ball. It's a little easier if it's a ball. The, the axis, yes. It's the axle for my, yeah, for my wheel here, that's the axis, the axis of rotation. Now, I put a wheel on here with a black line because the actual rate at which that's turning is the magnitude of the curl. All right, so now if I move, let me move to a different point in space. Let me move to a different point in space. I need to zoom back out. I'm going to have to go a little bit smaller. Okay, so let's see what happens if I move. Uh, 
I want to move to a different point in the vector field. So I'm actually going to move my point, which means I'm at a different point in the vector field, which means my, my direction vector is going to change, my curl vector is going to change. If the curl vector changes, then the speed of rotation changes. So keep an eye on the black wheel. Let's see if it speeds up or slows down here. So I have it calculating right now my, my curl vector and my magnitude. So right now, the magnitude of the curl is 1.2. I'm going to try and move it somewhere else where it's, where it's faster. Let's see here. Oh, that's slower. You want the green one to be longer, right? I want the green one to be longer. But I also want, well, the green one technically is, sorry, my code is a little limited here. I did not have it actually giving me the length, the correct length on the green. Because it could actually go way out, and I wanted you to see the vector. So here at this, my curl, my magnitude, my curl is 2. So that thing's moving pretty quick, right? But as, if I move it this way, over here, my curl, let me get it to be, uh, it was pretty small right in here. It's much slower there, right? Okay, so I, I always envision with curl like, you know, this molecule going through this very turbulent liquid and it's spinning as it's trying to move and, and maybe it gets slowed down. Does that make sense? So that's, that's our geometric interpretation of curl. Now, we can also have another interpretation of curl in two-dimensional space, which I think might be a little easier for us to see. So take a look at this. This is a two-dimensional vector field. And this is a point. And remember the curl vector is going, this is the ground, right? So the curl vector is either pointing out towards us or into the page, right? So imagine if you're this point, you have these little like, like paddles that stick out all over you. So if the flow on this side is stronger than the flow on this side for the points around you, then it's going to make you go like that, right? So can you tell from this vector field that the, ve the vector field is stronger over here than it is over here, right? So if I move my point over this way, which way should that, that paddle wheel start turning? Should start going clockwise. So I'm going to move my little guy over, and you can see it. You can see it turning, right? Now I'm getting, an, I'm getting a negative curl, and that's because it's, this is like a, a right-hand rule, right? So it's like you're turning this way, and so it's going into the page, whereas if it turned the other direction, it would come out towards us. But notice that it's, um, it's turning well, pretty fast, right? Not, not too bad. But if I go to the right more, what's going to happen? Now it's turning faster, right? Okay, and then if I go to the other side, it's going to turn the other direction, right? Because the vectors on this side are kind of pushing harder than the vectors on this side. And I think I made it where I can change the vector field. Yeah, I did. So let's try a different vector field, and we'll try and predict what's going to happen. This is kind of a weird vector field, right? So right here, looks like the vectors are pushing equally on both sides. And you can see my curl is zero. So if I move left and right, I should just maintain a curl of zero the whole time. What about if I move up or down? Uh-oh, oh, speed of wheel, oops, wrong one. Interestingly enough, my curl is zero everywhere in this vector field. Everywhere. Now our vector field here is the vector field x squared negative y squared. Okay, that's my two-dimensional vector field. So if I extend it into three, I have that. And if I do this and I do the curl of it and do my dels, I should get the zero vector out. I'm not going to do it, but you can check it for yourself that it would work. So you can, visually, I think it's kind of hard. 
you may have thought up here, you know, it's maybe <coughs> going to turn that way or something. I don't know. But, but this stays static the entire time. And in three-dimensional space, if we had a vector field that did the same thing, like what if you had a three-dimensional vector field, and at every point in the vector field, your point just wanted to go in a direction, but it didn't want to twist or turn or curl at all. If your curl was zero everywhere, kind of like here it's ev zero everywhere. I wonder, wonder if that tells us anything about the vector field. Any guesses? It's conservative. It's conservative. That's what it is. That becomes our, our test. So first, before I get to that major result, let me, let me uh, get some language here in order. So a curl vector creates an axis of rotation, and the magnitude of the curl gives us the speed of rotation about that point. If the vector field represents the velocity field of a flowing fluid, like water or oil or something like that, then the curl measures the tendency of the fluid to rotate or curl at given points in the fluid. If the curl of the vector field is zero, then there is no rotation and the field is called irrotational. If our vector field is in two-dimensional space, we can extend it into three-dimensional space by simply replacing the R component with zero. We just did that. And then here's the major result. So we saw back in 13.3 that if we wanted to check to see if a two-dimensional vector field was conservative, we did this check right here, right? That's the check we did. Now, if we are working with a vector field in three-dimensional space, then what we need to do to check to see if it's conservative is to see if the curl of the vector field is zero, the zero vector. If the curl of the vector field is a zero vector, then it is a conservative vector field automatically. Now, this is kind of, maybe this, maybe you'll find this interesting. If, if we have a two-dimensional vector field, okay, two-dimensional, but we extend it into three dimensions, right, like this, and we calculate the curl of this, then we're going to do partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z of p, q, and 0, right? And we just said a second ago that the first two components automatically are what? Zero. We know these are zero. But let's take a look at that last component. What's this last component? So we cover this up, right? And we do partial with respect to y of p minus partial with respect to x of q, right? I'm sorry? What did I say? Did I do this one? Yes. I don't know. That's. I'm, I'm just losing it. I don't know what else to say. It's the other way around, obviously. It's this minus that, right? Okay. So that's what that last component would be, right? But. To be conservative, right, we're saying that the curl must be the zero vector, which means that this last component must be what? Zero. And that's what we did to check earlier, right? In the previous section, that was the check. Oh, it's right here. Right? That's the check. So what we were doing is we were actually using this back in the previous section. We were saying, hey, look, like the curl has to be zero. We didn't know what curl was. The curl has to be zero. But if it's a two-dimensional vector field, we know the first two components are zero. So we just want to make sure that last component is zero. And that means these two have to be equal. And so that's how we checked for two-dimensional vector fields being conservative. But now we have a check for three-dimensional vector fields. With me? OK. All right, divergence. So what is divergence? So given a vector field in three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space where the partial derivatives exist, then the divergence of the vector field is defined to be div f, is the way we write it, div f, 
and look at this. This thing, the di divergence of a vector field is probably the easiest computation that we like have. It's, you take the P component and you take its partial derivative with respect to X plus the Q partial with respect to Y plus the R partial with respect to Z. And you just add up the answers and your, your answer is a scalar. So we don't have to do any complicated cross products or anything like that. Div is a very straightforward computation. And the way you could look at it, if you wanted to, is you can look at it like this. If I take that differential operator, del, that's del, right? If I dot that with p, q, r, if I dot it, dot product means like this times this, right? Plus this times this. But here, it's an operator. So it's the partial with respect to x of p plus the partial with respect to y of q plus the partial with respect to z of, of r. And that is what this is. So that's the notation that we can use for div. Del dot f. Curl is del cross f. Div is del dot f. All right? Would you agree it's pretty easy to, like, it should be easy for us to calculate div? Okay, so let's take that same example we had from before. That was the same vector field. We found the curl of that, right? We found the magnitude. Well, we found the curl. We found the curl at that point. We found the magnitude of the curl at that point. Now, what's the div? What's the div of that vector field at that point? So first, let's get div of f. Div f for us is going to be del dotted with the field, which is just the partial of this with respect to x, which would be 2xyz, plus, see it's not a vector, partial of this with respect to y, 2xyz again, plus that one, 2x, uh, that's yz again, which gives us, what, six of them? 6xyz. So at, at this point, the div is going to be zero. So the div of f at the point 2, 1, 0 is just 6 times 2 times 1 times 0, which is 0. Just replacing x, y, and z with the point. And it's a number, right? Not a vector. It's a number. Pretty nice computation, right? It's better than the, than the curl, isn't it? So what does the div give you then? If curl gives you that like kind of rotational thing happening, what is div giving you? So <clears throat> if the vector field represents the velocity field of a flowing fluid, then divergence measures the tendency of the fluid to diverge or leave a point in the fluid. Let me finish this and then I'll explain more. Given some point x, y, z in three-dimensional space, if you compute the div at that point and get a positive number, then the region around the point is called a source. Positive divergence means that the tendency is for things to be leaving that point. And the neg a negative divergence means that things are tending to want to go into the point. And if you have a divergence of zero, then the region is called incompressible because Things are not wanting to leave or come in. It's just static. So I'll try and show you with, the, with an example. I, the visual for this, I think, I'm pretty proud of it, actually. So here's what we're doing. Let's see if we can't wrap our heads around this idea. First of all, I want you to understand that that ball that I have there is like an infinitesimal point. All right, it's like really tiny, tiny point, infinitesimally small. But I'm going to zoom in on it so that you can understand what's going on. So this is a point sitting in three-dimensional space. All right. Now remember, there's a vector field here, isn't there? There's a vector field. So there are. Imagine that I take. Uh oh, hold on. Okay, so imagine that I take a bunch of points 
along the surface of this ball, right? Remember, this is like an infinitesimally small ball. Take a bunch of points around that ball and, and imagine at each of those points. So it's, I know it's hard to see from where you're sitting, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm picking points on that ball, a bunch of them. I wish I had, let me zoom in on this ball. What I'm doing is like I'm picking a point on the surface of that ball and I'm, I'm looking at the vector field at that point. And if, if the vector field, if the vector from the vector field is red, that means it's actually pointing into the ball. And if the vector field at that point is green, it's pointing out of the ball. Does that make sense? So you have this like infinitesimal ball. When you start looking on the surface of it, you're trying to figure out, are there more things wanting to go in or are there more things wanting to go out? So you have all the red and then you have all the green. Does that, that make sense or not? No? Okay. Yes, so imagine I have this, okay, in three-dimensional space, if we have a vector field, then if I go to a point, I have a single vector sticking out, right? Yes, that's what the vector field tells me. Divergence says, imagine that this point is no longer like a single little point. Imagine it's just a little tiny ball. So it has a little radius to it now, right? So you've got this little ball there. And so instead of looking at that point right in the middle, you're looking along the surface of that ball, and you're looking at all those points outside the ball. So let's say I take a point out here outside that ball, and I figure out what the vector field is there. And let's say that vector is like that. Then I would consider that to be a green vector, because it's pointing out of the ball. But let's say I move to another point on the ball right here, but that vector is pointing in. Then that's going to be a red vector. Understand? And what I'm trying to do is figure out, if I take all the points along that little ball, do I have more going out or more going in? So if I take this, if I take this and I, let me add some more vectors. So I'm gonna add a bunch more vectors and I might have to zoom out actually. Yeah. So what, do you, what is the sense that you're getting here from that picture? You have more green than red, right? And the greens are longer. The red ones, are, remember, the red ones are, are going into the ball. Now, they might punch out the other side, but they're going into the ball, right? The green ones are going out. It looks to me that you have more going out than in here. Do you agree? So it, the divergence, then, of this would be a positive number. You get a positive number because there's more going out than in. So it's almost like, you know, you have this point with this one vector. It wants to go that way. It's like if you go, if, if you were another point coming by this, right, like this, just kind of like skimming by almost like this is a planet or something, and you're coming by, the vector field wants you to do what as you get close to it? In this case, it, would, it looks like it would want to kind of push you away, right? It would want to, things tend to want to leave this ball as opposed to go into this ball. So this would, ha this would be called a source, a source point. Now if I, move the, if I move the point to a different place, or move that little ball to a different place in the vector field, I'm gonna have a different divergence. So let me move over. Look, at my divergence starting to get smaller. I'm moving the point, and it looks like, oh, I've got negative divergence. Can't really tell it's negative. Let me, let me spin this thing around. Oh, okay, you couldn't see it on the other side. So what you have here is you have more red coming out. You do have greens, right? They're going in, but they're shorter, right? Looks like we have more red coming out than green going in. This right here would be considered a sink. So you have a source is more green, red, more red you have a sink. Does that make any sense? Meaning that like the stuff around it wants to go into it. Wants to go into it, yes. And then if you have a div of zero, that's when we say it's incompressible, which means things don't want to go in or come out, which is kind of like if you try and compress water, right? It doesn't want to, can't compress liquid, right? Okay, that's a three-dimensional visualization of div. We can do a two-dimensional. It might be easier to see the two-dimensional. So let me show you 
this one. If I move this over, watch what happens. And I think I'll zoom in. Yeah, so you see the vector fields like this, right? The vectors that are on this side are longer than the vectors on this side. You've got along this top edge of this circle, you've got vectors going into the circle. But on this bottom edge, you've got vectors going out of the circle. And it looks pretty proportional, doesn't it? Like there's the same amount of red going in than, than the green going out. And it actually is exactly that. It balances itself out exactly. And you have a div of 0 here. And if I move, let's say, left and right, Let's see, it looks like my div changes, but it's all zero the whole time, right? Same amount going in as coming out. If I move up and down, makes no difference. Now, let me change the vector field. OK, look at that vector field. As I move around in this one, boy, everything's changing, right? Just depends on where I am. See my, my div calculation up there? My div right now is 2. I've got more, got more green going out. Make this circle smaller. See, the idea is that that circle is really supposed to be infinitesimal. But you can see, I think, that you've got more green coming out because these look a little longer than those red ones, don't they? Just a little bit. Let's see if I move up what happens. Uh, div changes a little bit up. Div starting to be zero right in there. There's div of zero. Come up here. I've got negative div now. Let me do a different vector field. There's kind of a crazy vector field. All right. I hope that helps. I know when I was a student in Cal 3, I had no, no idea what curl and div were because there was no visualization of it. So that's, that's the best I think I can do for you. Does that, does that help a little bit? OK. Just real quick. Yes. On the 3D, it was kind of easier to understand because of the sync. But like, for example, here the div is, is negative. Like, is it going, is it still going in towards the circle? Or there's, there's, mo there's more of a tendency to want to go in than out. All right, so look, it's, it's almost like if you were on this side, right? Right, like if you're over here, there's a stronger attraction in. On the other side, yes, it would be pushing you out. But if you sum it all up, if you add it up, there's more tendency to want to go in than there is to go out. Like, you, you know, you've got little, little guys standing on one edge pulling things out and guys on the other edge pushing things in. If you just add it up, there's more push in than out pull out. Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. So with this, we actually have a new version of Green's theorem. And I think this might be like confusing when you first look at it, but remember what Green's theorem told us last class? It said that the line integral over the closed curve uh, C of f dot dr was equal to the double integral over d of, what was it, partial p spec to y minus partial q with respect to x. Am I getting that right? da. Look at your greens. Right? OK. I guess I'll look it up. I just want you to double check it, that's all. 3, 5. If I have backwards, is partial Q. Yep, that's, I knew that didn't look right. OK, these are flipped. Sorry. What I just wrote was that formula from earlier. Partial Q with respect to x, partial P with respect to y. There we go. OK, that's our formula from last class, right? Now, this is saying, well, that is also equal to this. Well, look, curl of f. The curl of f, what did we have when we, when we did a two-dimensional vector field? When it was two-dimensional, what was that last component? That one. It was this, right? So imagine I take the curl of f. I'm going to get 
like arbitrary, like if f is three dimensional, right? I'm gonna get something here, something here, and we know that this last piece will be partial q with respect to x minus partial p with respect to y, right? That's what would happen if I do curl of f. But if I dot that with the k vector, what's the k vector? K hat, k hat, this vector is the vector 0, 0, 1, right? You have i, j, k, this is k vector. So if I dot these two vectors together, then this, you know, 0 times that, who cares? 0 times that, who cares? 1 times that, that gives you this. So it's just another way of writing. It's just like a, kind of a weird way of writing that, isn't it? But this will actually, we'll, we can use this later in later sections. We'll, sometimes we'll use this formula instead of this. Because maybe we'll know that the curl is 0 or something. If the k hat's always 0, 0, 1, then it's just going to be that multiplied by 1. Do you even have to write it? Say again? So if the k hat's going to be 0, 0, 1, uh -huh. yet you're going to uh, uh, multiply the dq dx uh -huh. by 1. Yes. 1, do you even need to write the k in there? If you don't have the k here, then that's the curl of f, which could have other stuff in it. Like, curl of f could have things other than zero there. It's only zeros there if it's two-dimensional. But even then, this right here, without the k, would, would be a vector. We don't want, we can't do a double integral of a vector, not yet. Um, so, so we need a scalar function in here, which means when we dot it with this, we get a scalar function. That makes sense? Okay. All right, um, do you all remember the theorem, or yeah, when we were defining conservative vector fields? Let me go back to it. Let me bring this up. This kind of little side note here. Got to remember which section. Fundamental theorem of line integrals. I think I got it right there. No, that was our test for conservative. Ah, where is it? 13.2. Line integrals. Looking for path independence here. I think I passed it up. Did. Yeah, I think it's 13.3. I think it just jumped through too fast. Oh, there we go. Here we go. This, we, we said that the line integral over C, this was our work, okay, is path independent if and only if that line integral gives us zero for every path, right? For every path. And then we say that um, line integrals over closed paths on conservative vector fields are path independent. What I'm trying to get you to see from this is if you look at this right here, what we need to say that something is conservative, a vector field is conservative, is if every single line integral that we could ever do over a closed path if this was zero, right? If this was zero, then we could say that the field was, was conservative, right? But if this is equal to this, what, what could you say that would guarantee that that would always be zero? If what? If the curl of f was zero. If the curl of f is zero, right, the zero vector, then this is zero and you dot it and that's zero, that whole thing's zero, and therefore this would be zero. So that's why we can use the curl of f as our test. To be a conservative vector field, we need every single one of these over any C that's closed to always be zero. Since this is this, as long as that's the zero vector, we have what we need. All right? So that's why we use it as a test. All right, I'm going to move on. There is another version of Green's theorem, which we will Use later, I'm just going to put it on the board and just know it's here. This is slightly different notation than what we used before. Um, 
You know how we've been doing FDR? If you look back in your notes, um, you know, I don't want to get too into it. Because this is a slightly, this is not work. This is something different. So if you do the line integral over the closed path C of F dot N, where N is the unit normal vector to the curve, um, DS, that that's equal to the double integral over D of div F DA. Just, just know this is here, and I'll bring it up later, OK? Just know this is here. So there are many relationships in, and identities involving curl and divergence. And it says here the next example shows how to prove it. So here is, here is a proof that I'm not going to go through all the steps of. I just want to show you how the flavor of it. So you're supposed to show here that if you take the div of the cross product of two vector fields, f and g, that that's equal to the vector field g dotted with the curl of f minus the vector field f dotted with the curl of g. That's an identity. So you have to prove that identity. So the way you do it is you start with one side and you try and turn it into the other. So I'll, I'll write it, or I'll put it here and I'll kind of zoom in so you can see this. That's not zooming, is it? Zoom out a little bit. So you start out with the, with the first side, left side. Div of f cross g, by definition, is del dotted with f cross g. So here is, here is uh, del, right? What is this right here? What is that? What is the computation they're doing here? This is a, this is a cross product of a three-dimensional, three, three vectors, right? So you know how we did like, remember how we did this? We did it once in class, right? And we did those little, and, and it came out to be this, like this in front of that times that minus that times that, you know. So they, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go through all this detail. This is for you to just see so you do that, and then you compute each of those, this, this, and this, and you get this. You just do some algebra, <laughs> move things around, and at the end, what you wind up looking at is this piece right here, this top piece, which is G dotted with the curl of F. So you have to recognize it. This is like PQR, that's your G field, and then times each of the components. This right here is the first part of the curl of f, this is the second part of curl of f, this is the third part of curl of f, and then you can work through it. So I don't want to do, show much at all because your next take home exam is going to have one of these and I want you to suffer through it because it really is messy, all right? But I'm going to leave that on the board so it's on video so that you can go back and look at that, that proof if you need to, all right? The challenge, I think, is for you, if on that take home exam that I give you, on the proof that you do, I would, I would start by you doing this one. Look at it, walk yourself through each of these steps, make sure you understand how each line comes about, and then after you do that, go try and do the one that I give you for the mini exam. Because I think once you see how all the mechanics of this work, makes sense from each line, the one that you do on your own will be a little easier. I will state that it, this does not show it here, but for this one, F, is the vector field, they're calling it P1, Q1, R1, and then G, sorry, is the vector field P2, Q2, R2. So when you see this, this is the F, this is the G, right? All right, we're gonna get out of this section. And we are moving on. Oh, I do want to save the changes to that. Now I have a handout for you. <clears throat> We're supposed to jump right into 13.6, but 13.6 is, well, they just assume that you're just going to pick up on something real fast, and I know that students don't, so we're actually going to take some time right now to discuss some preliminary things before we get into it. Now, I will.